It is a privilege, an honor, and a true joy for me to be here with you this morning, along with my family. Uh, they are not in here, as Pastor said. They are uh, with the kids this morning. We've got four of our own, and uh, and if you'd like an old prayer card, they're out in the out in the uh, oh, somewhere out there. You'll find them laying out there somewhere. You're welcome to grab one. I want to say thank you this morning to you as a as a church body. Uh, you have been a blessing to us, many of you, maybe even most of you, without actually knowing who we are, whether it's a, uh, you've just prayed in general for missions, you have blessed us. If you have given to missions, you have blessed us. If you have sent someone, sent a team member to Portugal, you have blessed us, and you've blessed the church, and we want to say thank you for that. My wife and I are, are keenly aware of the blessing that you have been. Uh, and so we, we say thank you. And, and uh, to say it is not, it's not quite strong enough, but we feel it. I wrote to, to Pastor Larry, um, the team was with us in July, Pastor Adam and, and the group, the team was with us in July. And so sometime after that, I, I wrote to Pastor Larry and I said, thank you, which I would do with anyone. I would say, thank you so much for coming, sending and serving. But, but added to that, so there is something that has been absolutely um, impacting uh, as a result of the North Central group coming. It's not happened once, but it's happened more than once. Uh, my own kids, they say, I just wish we lived closer to North Central because we would go there. Folks, you're blessed. You are blessed to be a part of this family, a part of this body, uh, this leadership, this pastoral staff. And so uh, so for that, we say thank you, Pastor Larry. You're the, you're the leader of that under the Lord, but you're the leader of that. And so thank you. Uh, for this opportunity. Pastor Larry's come. We've traveled many kilometers in Portugal together. In fact, we did it right before they closed the country down, um, uh, just a few few months before that. And, uh, and from that generated, or eventually, Pastor Adam and the group coming this last, uh, this last July. Also say thank you on behalf of the students, uh, the men particularly, the men of Mount Hope Bible Institute just outside of Lisbon, Portugal. Monte Esperança Instituto Bíblico das Assembleias de Deus, which means... Mount Hope Bible Institute in Portuguese, if you're a Portuguese speaker. If you're not, there's the, there's the translation. But I say thank you for them because as a result of you guys coming and, uh, and sending even the funds to help out with this, uh, they, they have guys today that aren't having to walk around in four layers of clothes. Uh, they can actually see their books when they study because their rooms have been redone. There's insulation, there's lighting, uh, there's windows, and North Central was huge in that. So thank you as well from those uh, young men. They're anywhere from about 18, 19 years old, up into their late 20s, and, uh, and they are grateful. I, I thought about uh, showing you a picture of them in their rooms, but thought, well, it's church, maybe in their pajamas, that's not the best uh, picture to be showing. So anyway, just a thanks from, from Gerson, uh, from Eduardo, from all of the guys who are part uh, of that, using it now and using it in the years to come. We're grateful. Uh, a little quick word about what we do before we hit the word, and if you'd like, you could already turn to John chapter 21. We'll be in John chapter 21 this morning, uh, looking at what God has to say to us. But, but just a little quick about the ministry itself. I've been guilty in the past of sharing the word and, and, and leaving folks wondering, well, that's, that's all well and good, and thank you for that, but what in the world do you do, you know, uh, aside from talk to us on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening or Wednesday night? And uh, so very, very briefly, uh, God has, has directed us to Portugal. We started in Angola. It was a training task. Church there growing. Uh, you were a part of that as well. And so uh, for that, we just give thanks to the Lord. But he took us unexpectedly to Portugal about uh, maybe getting close to 10 years ago. And as he took us back there, it was with this it was with this heart, Lord, help us to raise up your church. Church is already there, not like we're planting it, but church is there, but help us to raise up your church to go to the ends of the earth. Surely you've heard the Great Commission. Surely you've read Matthew 16, 15. Surely you know the words of Jesus, go in all the world and preach the gospel. Yes. Uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the words of Jesus, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and where? To the ends ends of the earth. But if you uh, here are like the folks in Portugal and like me, sometimes we hit a stage or a phase of that Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth and go, I'm good right here, right? Jerusalem is good for me. 
I'm happy. I'm just going to stick it out right here. This is the place I want to be. Or Samaria, and I'm going to stick there. But sometimes we don't, let, don't give God room to let him send us and use us in the way that he so desires. And so God just placed a seed in our heart to be in Portugal for that purpose. And I can tell you, God in this area is Working. When we arrived, there was no chance. There was no, if you were a young person, if you were a minister, if you were someone who said, man, God is speaking to my heart about the nations, about peoples of the world, different cultures. To go beyond the borders of Portugal, there would have been this much opportunity for you. Zero, zero opportunity for you. Zero form, fashion, manner for you to go. Today, praise God, by the grace of God, Portugal has a missions agency. Uh, um, yeah, that's the best word for it. It's a missions agency. Uh, I'm privileged to to direct that. And we have one missionary family that's on the field. You also were a part of sending them, not in their own support. But I tell you, I told you five years ago, I told the first group, I am maybe the worst attender ever at North Central. Last time I was here was five years ago. I uh, hope that you were here last week, all right? Uh, five years ago, 2018, uh, but probably right about this time of year, February, January, February, something like that, came and shared with you about a couple that said there were pastors, we're serving, but God is just burning our heart for Africa, for this different people, and, and we're gonna go. But our church has no way, no means, nothing. There's no openness to missions. There's nothing. So, so we're gonna sell our house. We're gonna do whatever we have to do. We'll fund ourselves. We just got to go. And that was where we were five years ago. Well, praise God. In, in the interim, God uh, established this missions agency. They've gone through the missions agency of the Assemblies of God of Portugal, and they landed in Cape Verde, the islands of Cape Verde, the island of Sal, which is salt, the island of Sal in Cape Verde in 2019, just a few months before 2020. Now, you might remember 2020, rather marking year for the world. They arrived, they knew no one, they knew nothing outside of the language, didn't know the culture, didn't know anything. So they, they arrived kind of uh, unhinged a bit, but they said, we are here to take Jesus to these people. And I'll tell you what, friends, God's done it. God's done it. In the midst of a closed down country, in the midst of a sealed off borders, in the midst of sickness, in the midst of it all, God has planted his church and there are new believers today. In fact, there's a young man, his name is Marlon. He is in a Bible school today, just three years later, as a result of that ministry. They started in a garage, they outgrew the garage, they went to a new place, they're below a, a discotheque, and uh, I tell you what, God is... God is working. And so praise God for all of that. We are a part of that. You are a part of that. And we say thank you. And there's a lot more, but praise God for that. <laughs> praise God for that. Uh, in John chapter 21, I, I was introduced, I was here two weeks ago, had a, uh, just, a just visiting family. Uh, by the way, Dan Thomas is my brother-in-law. And Dan Taylor is my name. So if Pastor Larry was thinking of Thomas, and anyway, sorry about that. But you did, you introduced, but that's okay. That's all right. Thomas is a good name too. <laughs> Same initials. <laughs> Uh, we were just visiting family a couple weeks ago, and I got introduced then to the journey that you were on, the 260 journey, right? I hope you're doing that. I hadn't known about it before that, but since that time, I, I kind of tried to catch myself up and, and learn about it. And, and this week, as I was listening, uh, one of the focuses was love. If you've been following along, that was one of the focuses. And this, I'd like to continue in that vein, talking about uh, love and the mission. Love and the mission. Where do those fit together? What does that look like in a very personal way? personal sense. If I go back to my elementary school days, which admittedly are getting farther and farther in the rearview mirror of my life, but if I go back to my elementary school days, about this time of year, it was Valentine's. And in Valentine's, I don't know how it's done today, but in Valentine's in my days, in those good old days, right, we'd, we'd hand out little boxes of candies, those little, those little um, sugared hearts. I don't have no idea what they're called these days, but those little hearts, uh, 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 suckers, little, little Valentine cards, right? Is this striking a bell? Anyone, anyone knows that? Okay. So we would do that. And occasionally, just occasionally, in those that you receive, and that was pretty cool, you, you know, cute little boy that I was, I might receive a note. A note. I mean, a folded up piece of paper, right, as a part of the Valentine's. And on the front, it would say, Danny. Now, I'm Dan today, but oh, then I was Danny. And little Danny got a note, and Danny would open up that note and go, oh, what could it be? It probably smelled funny because it was from a girl, not a boy. And so, I mean, funny, but nice. And, and so you'd open it up, and it would say, Danny, do you like me? And then there'd be usually a couple of squares. Uh-huh. And well, they'd say, yes and no. And, and please check one, right? Yes, no, and then return the note. And, and, and they say, please, do you like me? And sometimes it would say, do you really like me? And then there'd be those two squares, yes and no. And on the rarest of occasions, do you love me? Yes and no. How awkward is that? 
I mean, in one sense, it's kind of exciting because you're a young kid and, and as a boy at that age, go, yeah, girls are, you know, icky and the girls would say, yeah, boys are stinky or whatever uh, you, you might say. So you're not really supposed to like girls. You're supposed to like, but you kind of have your eye open and go, oh, she's cute or he's funny or whatever it happens to be. And it's a little awkward, though, to get there and go, what do I do with this? If I actually think I like this young little girl and I answer it, I like you, I really like you. Well, that just puts me at risk of running out of the He-Man Woman Haters Club, for those of you who ever watched. Like, yeah, I mean, if, if the rest of the boys found out that I said I like this girl, that's bad. That's bad. But if, if I don't say anything, well, that's going to hurt her feelings. Or if I write back and say, no, no, well, that's mean. That's mean. I can't do that. So the best solution, even in those young days, was say nothing, Right? Just don't answer the note. Just pretend, just ignore it and pretend that it never happened and it'll go away. But you harbor the, well, you know, she probably wrote it because she likes me. Uh, I've been introduced in my short time in Texas. This is not my native state. But even on the way down here yesterday out of the Dallas area, we stopped by a place called Mucky's. And I just want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you, God, and thank you, Texas, for Mucky's. Wow. Anything I need, I can find there, right? Anything, right? Duct tape, you know, food, whatever, gas too. Uh, cleanest bathrooms, amazing. Stopped at Bucky, saw a t-shirt. Saw a t-shirt. This is my, my, one of my teenage daughters. We've got three kind of in that bracket, or two, I guess. It's 21, 18, 16, and 7. And uh, the, the, the 16-year-old, she says, come take a look at this shirt, Dad. You got to see it. She said, I think I want this one. On the shirt, nice little chicken picture, kind of country scene. It says, I have selective hearing. You have, were not selected. <laughs> she said, I have got to have that shirt. I have selective hearing you. How many of you have been guilty ever of selective hearing? Yeah, I think all of us. All, kids, you who have, you are parents, you have kids. Are, do our kids suffer from selective hearing? It's not hearing loss in most cases. It's selective hearing. So, I had no idea you said that, Dad. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we were right next to each other. My youngest daughter says that on a break. I didn't hear you, Daddy. Uh, I'm sure that you did. Same thing with teens. Say, uh, men, men, does this happen? You who are married with your wives, or maybe wives, I should ask, does this happen with your husbands? No, 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 never. Say, no, I had no idea that that needed to be done in the house. I never heard you. Selective, selective hearing. I even heard just a week and a half or so ago, ran into a gal. She said, my dog has selective hearing. And my dog is deaf. Yes, my dog learns sign language with us for communication. And there are times when my dog will pretend it doesn't hear me or see me, will turn away so it doesn't have to obey. Well, friends, when, we, when I think about that, that selective hearing, I'm guilty. But when God asks you or God asks me a tough or uncomfortable question, do we practice selective hearing? Yeah, wow, ouch. Because it's true. There are times when God speaks to us and we say, not really interested. I'm sorry, what was that, God? What, what, were, you, what were you speaking? Whether it's a, a call for our lives, whether it's a specific moment in obedience, whether any, any matter, giving, we had it mentioned already this morning. But as, we, as God speaks to us, there are times that we kind of tune him out. But let me share with all of us this morning or remind us that selective hearing and the believer do have nothing in common. There should be no selective hearing. Nothing would go together worse than selective hearing and the believer. Jesus is the king. He's the Lord. He's our savior. He is unrivaled. He has done everything for you and me and for all of this world. And he, as our king, when he speaks, he deserves not just the ears, but the heart. We must listen to him when he speaks. We can't disregard him. And today we want to ask and answer an uncomfortable question about love and the mission. John chapter 21. Let's read this passage beginning in verse 15. And the context is this is the appearance, uh, third appearance of Jesus shortly before he goes up to heaven. Uh, the, the, they're in the boat. The boat gets, uh, they catch all the fish once again, 153. And Jesus said, come eat with me. He's here on the shore. Verse 15, John chapter 21. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. 
The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus was asking him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. And verse 21, when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And I would just stop there and say, isn't that like us? When God is speaking to us, there are times maybe we're being challenged. Maybe he's really uh, uh, getting a hold of our character or grabbing a hold of our will or, or wanting to have our will placed in his hands, something like that. And we try to divert. It's a tactic. It's a divert. Hey, what about him? I really want to know what's going on with him. I don't want to deal with what's going on with me. And Jesus answered in verse 22, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. You must follow me. May God bless the reading of his word. What do we have? Jesus is about ready to go to heaven. Third appearance after the resurrection. He's been, he suffered. He's crucified, died, buried, resurrected. And now he's appearing for the third time to his disciples. He's about ready to go. And, and in, in being about ready to go, he is about ready to pass off his charge, his ministry to his believers or his followers, his disciples. He's about ready to take that baton, which today, if you're a runner or ever were a runner, I'm a, I was a runner. I'm not a, am a runner. I was a runner. It's that baton. It's that little aluminum little stick that runners, usually four of them have, and they run around the track and they pass it off from one to the other. Does everyone know what we're talking about? We're passing it off, passing the baton from one to the other. In Portuguese, the word for baton, if you run a race and you run with a baton, you run with a testemunho. For you Spanish speakers, you'll know that a testimonio means it's a witness. It's a witness. And so you actually run with the witness in your hand. And I run as fast as I can carrying the witness. And I pass the witness off to the next runner. And the next runner runs around with the other witness. That's what Jesus is doing. He says, you are my witnesses. Peter in Acts talks about that. says, we have seen. We can't stop talking about what we've seen and what we've heard. We're witnesses. And Jesus is passing it off about at this moment. He's saying, these are my last few words, my last few times or moments with you. I'm passing this off to you. And all of the church and all of the mission depends on it. So let me ask you today, this morning as a church, how important do you think these words are? Is Jesus just going to walk up and say, hey, boys, what's up, man? How's it going? Something light, something trivial? No, he's going to go right to the heart of the matter, as he always does. He's going to go right to the heart of the matter, and he's going to leave with his followers, with his disciples, the words that are most important. So first of all, what does he say? Go to, we'll work in, in reverse order, verse 19. What does he say? He says, follow me. And he repeats that in verse 22. Don't worry about the other guy. You must follow me. Follow me. Well, that's not easy, but okay. It's kind of comprehensible. If you can uh, uh, picture this from Peter's perspective, he's listening to Jesus. When Jesus says, follow me, he says, okay, I get it. I followed you everywhere. Oh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, we have traveled it all, and it's not been in a speed train. It's been on foot. It's been by boat. We've gone everywhere. I've seen you do miracles. You have sent me and the others out to do miracles. And we did by the grace and power of God. Uh, this is amazing. Okay, I understand it. So what do I do? I preach the kingdom of God. I do what you did. I make disciples. I identify with you, Jesus. And I suffer because of your name. Not easy, but I get it. Follow me. Follow me. He had responded to that call uh, three years earlier when he was fishing. Jesus said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He left it all. He said, okay, I get the idea. Follow me. Now look at verses 15, 16, and 17. What else does Jesus say? He says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Or, or in verse uh, uh, 16, it says, take care of my sheep. I don't know how many shepherds we have in this congregation here. I am not one, but I live across the street from one in Portugal. We have sheep coming uh, on a daily basis from wherever they pasture at night to the pasture that's kind of in front of us and across the way. And so several times a day we see the sheep come in and we, we see the interaction between the shepherd 
and his sheep. What does the shepherd do? The shepherd protects. The shepherd leads the sheep to pasture, leads them to the food that they need, takes care of them. If one is lost, what does the shepherd do? Goes and gets it. We see this in the Bible, right? Leaving 99 to go find one. We've seen it in Portugal. One is lost. Lost one little lamb is kind of meh, meh, looking for its mother. And it's not too long before you hear, and the car, and the car, which is the word to say, come on. Come on right here. Hearing the voice of the shepherd, the sheep takes off meh, and ends up with the shepherd. Why? Because goes looking for the one. The shepherd will sacrifice for the sheep, will fight for the sheep, will give its life for the sheep and Jesus here when he says feed my sheep take care of my sheep he's not talking about physical sheep he's talking about the body he's talking about the church he's talking about people and so he's saying don't be a physical shepherd but be a spiritual shepherd do what you do for the sake of the gospel and I would ask all of us this morning myself included is what I do and how I live and how I work for the sake of the gospel or is it for the sake of me and then Jesus says, verses 15, 16, and 17, he asked this question. He says, do you love me? What? That's a little offensive, wouldn't you think? If you were Peter, if you had followed with Jesus, given up your profession, left your family, done things in his name, followed him at his feet, slept next to him. You're one of the three special ones that are identified in his special group. And Jesus, right here, right now, is calling into question. He says, do you love me? Do you love me? That's uncomfortable. But friends, that's the same question that Jesus asked to his church uh, of all time and asked to us today. Do you love me? If you are going to complete my mission, if you are going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to all peoples, every corner of spring and beyond, if you are going to do that, then it starts with this. Do you really love me? And Peter, interestingly, he replies, and, and when you read something, you don't get tone of voice, but you kind of start to get an idea just a little bit. The first answer, Jesus says, do you truly love me? You go, <laughs> yeah, yes, Jesus, of course I love you. Kind of that quick, trite answer. You ever been asked an awkward question in front of other people before? Uh, um, I'd rather not answer that. That's a little awkward. And maybe it's asked a second time, just like Jesus does. Peter, do you love me? And so he has to get a little more intentional. Yeah, Jesus, you, you know, you know that I love you. And then there's this third time. And somewhere in that questioning and somewhere hitting that third time, Peter understands. And the word says in verse 17, and uh, he, Peter was hurt. He was hurt. He was, his heart was sorrowful because he was instantaneously remembering that three times he had denied Jesus, even though he had sworn he would never deny Jesus. But Jesus right here is restoring him, and he's saying, if you will love me, then you will be able to feed my sheep, and you will follow me. But you cannot follow me or feed my sheep if you do not love me. North Central. Missionary, all of us, we like the follow, we like the feed, let's go on the mission trip, let's go hand out the bags, let's go uh, work in the school, let's go do something that's good for the kingdom, but maybe that good for the kingdom doesn't start with love for Jesus Christ. It must start with love. Love is central. Love is key to the mission of God. Jesus knew what was ahead of Peter, and he mentions it in verse 18. He says, I know what's going to happen. I know the end of your physical life. I know how challenging this will be. I know how great the task is and how physically and spiritually and emotionally painful it will be. And unless you love me, you aren't going to make it. You won't hold on. You're going to give up. You're going to give in to the pressures that are around you. You're just going to say, well, that's it. I, I'd rather do something else. It's a whole lot easier doing anything than following you. And Jesus knew that. And so he gets to the core right at the beginning. He says, Peter, do you truly love me? So this morning, church, there's a question for us. There's a question for me. Do I love Jesus? I was telling someone in the foyer, uh, between services that this message God gave to me, uh, beginnings of it, I shared with Pastor Larry, beginning on Wednesday of this week. And you know, when the Lord speaks to your heart for others, he's first speaking to you. And I had to stop where I was, say, Jesus, 
Do I love you? Well, yes, of course I love you. Give my life. I've got prayer cards that say I love you. But do I love him? Peter had the same kind of thing. He had all the badges. Been there on the Sea of Galilee. Been there at the feeding of the 5,000. Been there when the lame was healed. Those are all of my badges. Got it on the backside too. I'm looking good. But Jesus says, do you love me? This morning, friends, for the love of our Savior, will you please ask yourself the same question? Do I love Jesus Christ? With all of my heart, unreserved, wholeheartedly, exclusively for Jesus Christ. If you don't, the mission's going to stall and you're going to give up. Quickly about love. What do we know? What are the facts? Facts of love. First of all, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. It's, it's indisputable. It's the fact of all facts. God loves you. When Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? It's already understood that Jesus loves him or that God loves him. Well, how do we know that God loves us? Here we go. The Bible says so. Jesus did so and God is so. Okay, say it again. The Bible says so. Jesus did so and God is so. The Bible says that he loves me. I have loved you with an everlasting love. He says to his people, he says, I show love to a thousand generations of those who love me and are called according to my purpose. He says, neither death nor life, angels, demons, present, future powers or anything else in all of creation can separate me from what? The love of God that is in Christ Jesus. How great is the love of the father that he's lavished upon us and calling us sons and daughters or children of God. The Bible tells us God loves us. He loves you. Jesus did so. That's how we know. Jesus emptied himself of everything, everything, everything. Philippians chapter 2. He emptied himself of everything. All of heaven, all of his godness, all of his glory, all of the worship of the angels, all of the worship of the saints, everything. He gave it all up. The Bible says he emptied himself of that and he made himself as a man, as a lowly man. Why? Because he loves us. God so loved the world that he what? He gave his son. Wow. Jesus did so and God is so. If you look in 1 John, what does it say about God? God is Love. Ponto final, Portuguese. That's him. That's it. No discussion. Ponto final. God is love. Love is who he is. You say, well, my behavior, my behavior might exclude me from his love. My children don't always behave, but my love for them never changes. Can you identify with that? I might do this or this or this or this, or I might go a different way, but that doesn't change the love that the Father has for me. Peter denied his Savior, denied his Master, denied his Lord, and yet that continued, or the love of God continued for him. Behavior doesn't change God's love. Circumstance doesn't change God's love. Yeah, I've been hurt. I've got family issues. I've got all these kinds of things, hunger, neglect. I was wronged, whatever it happens to be. All of that can be true. But truer still is that my circumstances don't change God's love. God loves you. God loves me. God loves you. Doubts are real. Loss is real. Lack is real. Failure is real. But God is real. God is real. And it's his love that he wants us to experience. Friends, have you had a moment? No. Let me ask it differently. When can you think back and when can you remember the last time that you were in the presence and you experienced the love of God? Experienced, not heard about, not read about, but experienced. What did it do to you? Friends, when I am in the presence of God and I feel his love, I am undone. I am undone. There was a Bible school student sat right in front of me. I was teaching a class. I opened the, the, the morning with a, a devotional. Then a word of prayer, and then we were going to get into whatever the topic was that day. He was sitting right in front of me, have the, have the devotional time, just the thought from the word. And then at prayer time, and I, I say amen and look up, and I'm ready to get on with the class. And he's just sitting in front of me, weeping, tears running down his face. Like, whoa, this was not an altar call. <laughs> this isn't a church service. What's going on? Well, I am okay, just kind of worked around that, and whatever you need to do, go take care of that. And we just went on with the class. Later on, he came to me, he said, I'm sorry, sorry I disrupted, sorry I couldn't be a part of class. Right at the beginning, he said, when I was thinking about the man that I was, when I was thinking of the place that God has taken me from, 
when I was thinking about how good God is to me, when I was thinking of the fact that he loves me, he said all I could do was just weep in thankfulness before the Lord. The woman who, the, the, the woman in the, the sinful woman in Luke chapter seven, I think it was, she washed Jesus' feet with what? Not soap and water, but her tears. She had been forgiven much. When we're in the presence of the God who loves us, we are undone. We are undone. Praise God for that. When I think about the Lord, you know that old song I said 20 years ago in the last service and I found out it's older than that. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, you know that song? How he saved me, how he raised me, how he picked me up, how he set my feet on solid ground. What does it make me want to do? Oh, it makes me want to shout. And even this week from Wednesday until now, my family can testify to this as I was working on this and I was reflecting on how much God loves me. I was going around the house singing, when I think about the Lord, oh, just makes me want to shout. My little seven-year-old was going, hallelujah, <laughs> praise God. We just say thank you, God, because why? He loves us. He loves us. He loves us, but friends, not just that. He's, here's the second fact. He loves those who are lost. He loves others. We're not exclusive in this love game. It's just not a note that comes to you. Hey, Danny, do you, don't you? It's going to all of us. He loves all of us. His, his creation is his most prized possession. And of his creation, man, mankind is his most prized possession even still. You are prized. You are loved. And those who are lost are loved by God. Wow. So who is it that he loves? He loves those who don't know him. He loves those who don't know him. Well, think about a, a gal from Holland. She came and somehow she ended up at the gates of the Bible school, the entrance of the Bible school, about the time of chapel several years ago. I do not know how she got there. We're in Portugal, Portuguese speaking. She doesn't speak Portuguese, whatever, whatever. Because of the English connection, we spoke. She went into chapel with us. And chapel is basically like a church service. A lot smaller, a little different, but it's like a church service. And so what do you do? You stand up and sing. You sit down, you listen to the word, you pray. Amen, praise God. All of that stuff. She sat down right next to my wife and I, and we were going to stand up. Say, hey, we did explain it all to her because it was in Portuguese and she didn't know. And, and we said, we're going to stand up and we're going to sing. She said, oh, is this when we get to dance? She had no idea. We, we finished singing and we sat down and we said, we opened up the Bible and says, we're going to read from the Bible now and listen to hear what God has. He says, oh, is that a Bible? I've heard about that. Friends, there are people who don't know. There are people who don't know and God loves them. Think about a Spanish man, Valencia, Spain. One of our colleagues, one of our missionary colleagues uh, was speaking in a park and, the, and he's speaking about Jesus. Afterwards, the man speaks to the missionary and he says, that Jesus that you were talking about, I have never heard about him before. I live in a land where religion is the king. Religion is the thing. Religion is in the words that we speak. But I have never heard about Jesus before. I remember a, a Uruguayan girl, 2006. God took us down to Uruguay for, for something. I was a children's pastor at the time. Little girl sitting in street ministry right here. Uruguay is the only atheist or, non, uh, or secular state in all of uh, Central and South America. They said, we want nothing to do with God. She grew up in the middle of nothingness, a vacuum in terms of God. And when we got to the place, do you know what Jesus did for you? And I just remember, it's fixed in my mind. The, the absolute incredible hunger and intensity on her face. That, no, I have no idea, but I want to know. Who does God love? He loves those who are lost. He loves those who are different by look, by language, by culture, by way of life, by economic status. He loves those who are different. He loves those who have turned their backs on him. I was looking through pictures this week of the last few years. And friends, if there was time and if you had the patience, we could tell you lots of wonderful stories. But I was looking through the pictures and I ran into a few pictures, not one picture, but a few pictures about several people of people who have been the, the superstar Christian. And today you will not find them anywhere but far from God. Superstar Bible school student. He could speak it better, play it better, sing it better, convince you better, altar call it better. He was amazing. He studied it. He knew it. And today he wants nothing to do with God. Ah, he loves, God loves those who have turned their, turned their backs on him. He loves those who have forgotten, who've been hurt, who are hurting, who have slipped. God loves us. Friends, love is central to God's mission. And God's, God loves all who are lost. Here's a third fact for us. To love God is to love who he loves. First, he loves me or he loves you. Secondly, he loves those who are lost. 
And third, to love God, listen careful, to love God is to love those that he loves. Which means Peter, when being asked the question, uh, Peter, do you love me? It's tied up in that. If I say yes, that means I must love those who God loves. Friends, this morning, as you hear the same question, do I love Jesus? Jesus asking you, do you love me? When you say yes, and I pray that you do, when you say yes, it's in there, there must be an expression of that love. It's not kept up. It's not just for a little Valentine's card. There must be an expression of that love that changes our world. Paul got it. The Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 9, he wrote about it. He said, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm going to tell you the truth right here is what Paul's writing. I have great sorrow and increasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Did you listen to that? Paul, the apostle that most of us go, if I could be like him. Am I right? Wow. Wow. What a life. Dedication and everything else. Incredible. Amazing. God is so good. God is working in this man. Wow, if I could just be like Paul. Paul's certainly in heaven. I got questions for him, man. How what was that blind Damascus Road thing? That was amazing. And Paul says, I would give it all up. I would give up heaven itself if I could get my brothers, my Jewish brothers, to know and love the Messiah like I do. Friends, I don't know that you and I have reached that point where you say, I'm willing to give up heaven and spend eternity suffering so that someone else can know Jesus. To love God is to love those that he loves. To finish up several years ago, 2015, we had a chapel service in the, in the Bible school there in Portugal. It was a missions chapel, kind of like your mission Sunday. I was speaking that day, and, and um, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm not really sure. I grabbed a box. The box was full of flags, flags of different countries. And I held up the first flag, this flag of Portugal. So I said, what is this? Well, they know what it is. It's a bandeira. It's a flag. So what does this represent? Ah, it represents us, everything about us, the, the soccer that we love and the food that we love and the culture that we have and all that. I said, you're right, it does. Let's put that one aside. Let's pick up another flag. Picked up another flag from a different country. What does this represent? Well, the same thing, but for another country. And we picked up another one, another one. Said it doesn't just represent a nation or a government. It doesn't just represent rules or a flag or geography. It represents people who by the millions are desperately without their Savior, Jesus Christ. Can we pray this morning for them? And so I said, here, listen, you take this flag and you go stand over there. Someone else go stand with them and pray. Start to pray for that country. Pray. You don't know it. You don't know the language. You don't feel pray for them. And here's another flag. You pray over there. And we began, we circled the whole of the chapel that day and we began to pray. I hate to say it, but it's true for all of us as Christians. We can have prayer meetings in which we are present in body, but we are not present in spirit. Right? We say, oh, we're going to pray for the lost. God save them. Amen. Anybody hungry? Let's go get some Whataburger or whatever. We want to go out. We're already thinking. We're already doing. And then there are times when God grips our hearts. And no longer is prayer just prayer, but it is the essence of our being. And that morning, God fell upon us by his spirit and tears began to fall as the, those who were holding the fa- flags began to sense the immensity of the task, the gospel that was so needed, the darkness that existed in those places. And tears fell. Why? Because God was beginning to put his heart into the heart of those students and pastors and teachers and myself included. Why is that? Because to love God is to to love those he loves. In that chapel, to conclude, in that chapel that day was a couple. Young couple. Today they're in their mid-30s, thereabouts. A young couple. And God had been kind of speaking on their hearts about missions. And good couple, fun couple. Loved to be with them. Great, great uh, students. Just great family. And they were in that chapel. And, and, uh, and, and God did some good things. And I don't know specifically what he did in them that day. But years then passed. They entered pastoral ministry. They were traveled different parts of the country of Portugal. And they were serving. Go to last Christmas. Christmas before last. So just over a year ago. Called him. His name is Elio. Elio. I'm just wondering. Just have something on my heart. I'm just wondering if God is speaking to you and your wife about serving as missionaries in Africa. And he said, Dan, I'm blown away. No. Thank you. And he didn't hang up that fast, but that was the idea. Wow, I'm honored that I would be thought of, but no, thank you. We are comfortable. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'll talk with it about my wife. Talk about it with my wife. A few weeks later, we talked about it. I said, well, where are you? Is this something that God is maybe speaking your hearts about? They said, you know what? God has spoken to us about missions, but this, this is not the time. This is, this is not really it. It's not really the people, not really the place. Uh, no, no. I said, okay, we'll just be praying with you. Hung up. For those of you who have been with us there, I went from the Bible school to my house, which is uh, one village down here. Go up a steep hill, go to the next village. That's where my house is. Takes a matter of moments, minutes. Boom, just up there. So from the time it took to, to hang up, say goodbye, uh, uh, get out, drive up the hill, get to the car or get to the house and walk in and just start to talk to my wife. Maybe seven minutes. My phone rings. Elio, can I reconsider? Can I reconsider? Elio, of course you can. Why? He said, because as soon as I hung up the phone, God started to contend. He started to work in our hearts. And we know, Dan, this makes no sense. There's nothing that's comfortable about what's being asked of us. There's nothing that's nice about it. We like where we are. We are liked where we are. But God is saying to obey, and this is where he has us to go. And so without any sense in the world, we say, yes, friends, today, that couple was in a church in Portugal sharing their burden, their vision to go to Africa to serve as missionaries. They'll be the second missionary couple sent out through the missions agency. And God willing, they'll be there this summer. Because why? Because to love God is to love those he loves. And so we just return to the question that Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Would you stand with me? Stand with me, would you, in, in an attitude of prayer? Maybe that's closing your eyes if that helps. Teach that to our youngest daughter just because she's distractible. If you're distractible, maybe close your eyes. But in an attitude of prayer, we need to respond to the question. To hear the word and not respond to the word, it's like looking in the mirror, forgetting who we are. God says, listen to the word and do something about it. Jesus is asking you this morning, do you love me? Follow me, it's there. Take care of my sheep, feed my sheep, that's there. But it starts with, do you love me? Ask God, God, do I really love you? Jesus, is it really with my whole heart that I love you? Do I love you enough to love those that you love? Here at home and all around the world. Oh God, do I love you? I want to go, I want to serve, I want to be, but God, do I love you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friends, we're going to open up the altar. I shared this with the first service, the first time I was ever in North Central Church. I sat down, I was completely anonymous. No one knew me outside of the family members that are part of this church. Completely anonymous that day. And the pastor spoke a message. And I remember the condition of my heart and the way God spoke to me at that time. I was, I was anxious, maybe you could say desperate, in my heart like, I hope he says the altar is open because I need to go. And my prayer is that this morning, someone is here going, oh, I was just hoping he'd say that because I need to go to the altar to meet with Jesus. Friends, the altar is open. Meet with the Lord. Tell him you love him. Apologize. Beg his forgiveness if you don't love him. Call on his name. If you call on his name today, you will be saved. And he will set your feet upon a new path, a new life. If you love Jesus up to the point of Jerusalem or, or Judea, but no further than that, you say, oh God, my love has been really weak. Heavenly Father, this morning in humility, this morning in gratefulness, this morning even perhaps in repentance, we come to you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your sacrifice, your expression of love. We thank you, God, for all of these things. And today as we hear the word, we hear your voice asking us, Peter, do you love me? Do I love you, Jesus? Oh, God, let your church ask and answer the question. Let your church respond to you with boldness, with humble hearts. Oh, God. Let our love for you be great. Let my love for you be unreserved. Let my love for you be without the conditions that I've been placing on them. But may I love you 
so that I can do something for you and I can follow you. Oh, Spirit of God, I pray that you'd meet with each one of your children. Son, daughter, old, young, here at the altar and in their seats. Friends, as we conclude this service, I invite you to be in an attitude of prayer. Let the Lord Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit, work in you. Let his word work in you, friends. Because in the end, it will be for his glory and for your good. And someday we'll be around the throne, worshiping the Lord. And only then may we know what this moment meant. Hallelujah. The altar is open. Open your hearts to him and be blessed of the Lord. In Jesus' name.